Two questions. Um, we've watched uh, Carter Phone and MCI and the explosion of IP services and various networks. And before I was a lawyer, I spent significant time in uh, telephone companies straddling divestiture uh, and also in uh, core network hardware computer server design and rollout. Uh, my two questions are, um, I guess one for, I can't read your name tag very well, Ms. Uh, Sohn. It's for you. Um, <coughs> if network neutrality is um, merely the leveling of the playing field, if you will, at the on-ramp level, um, how, what would you do to prevent, with regulatory measures, the use of either hardware or software, be it on an IP level for broadcast network protocols or at the switching level with telecommunications, more traditional protocols, packet switching and, and their evolutionary uh, paths on the net itself. In other words, within the network, if you want to make a level playing field like a traffic light on a freeway entrance ramp in a busy time, uh, it'll just be regulated with the packet switching on the net uh, at some level or by manipulation of broadcast um, technologies. That's the first okay, question. Okay, I'm going to limit you to one question because we have several other questioners in very short time. So, okay, well, my, um, my second one was just if okay, I... Okay, so I'm, well, she can answer your first it's, question. It's a, Thank you, sir. Okay, go ahead. And you can get back in the line if there's extra time, but I, I really need to limit people to one question. Okay. I mean, I doubt this is going to satisfy you, but I, look, I would say even though Marvin and I are proponents of, of net neutrality, we don't want this to be a massive regulatory scheme, you know, 100 pages of regulation. And in fact, if you look at the actual notice of proposed rulemaking, it's a page and a half of regulation. Okay, so, you know, I think it's going to be up to the agency, and I'm sure Commissioner McDowell is going to be a huge help in this regard, uh, to ensure that the regulations are very narrow and that they're targeted to the on-ramps and not to the Internet as a whole. Yes, sir. So about the only thing that all of you seem to agree on is that more competition would help alleviate any concerns here in the first place. And I was wondering if any of, you, uh, uh, sorry, any of the panelists had ideas for promoting more competition in the area, for example, maybe through changing the terms of use of the public air, uh, airwaves to lower barriers to entry in that market, or just any other ideas any of the panelists might have. Promotion of competition. I'll, I'll try and I'll, and I'll say some things that are, I'll explain what's controversial and what isn't. So the question about can we get more spectrum for mobile broadband, uh, this is a question that's being discussed in terms of the national broadband plan that the FCC is uh, putting together. And the FCC would like to find spectrum, which is like wireless frequencies, that are being underutilized or utilized in sort of old antiquated ways and make them available for mobile, mobile broadband. And the two uh, largest candidates for transitioning of use over to mobile broadband happen to be the TV spectrum. And the reason why is because a lot of people watch TV over uh, satellite and cable, not over the air. And it might be cheaper to just give everyone satellite service and auction off that spectrum to to higher value uses. It's very controversial among the broadcasters. Uh, it's been suggested and it's been heavily debated. Second uh, place to look for spectrum would be the military and the government. Lots of spectrum there that people aren't sure how it's being used and we can't be sure how it's being used because you know, national security, you can't always ask how is this band being used. Uh, but the, the government is, uh, is working with the private sector to figure out how to get more spectrum out there. Uh, in terms of more competition on the wireline side, uh, the, the main two options you could think of are one, an entirely new wireline deployment like broadband over power line or some new wireline facility. Uh, those have all seemed to be doomed and, and not have succeeded for the last 20 years of predictions. And then there's also the option of sort of moving back to an open access unbundling regime where, where competitors could put their technologies and lease the incumbent's pipe and put, te put technologies at the end and compete with them. Uh, there's just a, a big report com uh, commissioned by the FCC done by Harvard suggesting that 
a lot of the nations around the world have succeeded as a result of policies like that. They have broadband speeds 10 to 100 times faster in some areas, far cheaper. Uh, there are a lot of uh, difficulties in implementing that kind of policy, and it's, uh, it, it failed in the U.S. for a lot of political reasons as well as perhaps uh, technical reasons. Would you like to be heard? Oh, and, and one, one final point. Getting more competition is a lot easier in big cities than in rural areas. So you'd have two different issues, one for rural areas, one for, for cities. Great. Thank you, Marvin. The, the last idea would be the worst thing to create competition. I mean, if, if you want to see that $70 billion a year that's deployed to build the infrastructure dry up overnight, you put a requirement that they have to share that infrastructure with yet unknown competitors. Um, the, the, taking some of the things Marvin said one step further, particularly on the spectrum, um, if we transition to a regime where spectrum was in fact a property, right, and you uh, took away the restraints on how you use individual sectors in that spectrum, um, I think you could have enormous additional competition in broadband and the various uh, services that traditionally we use for the spectrum for. One of the things that I, I wanted to note was Marvin mentioned all the problems with the old AT&T. Um, they, they originate because they operated under a culture of regulation under Title II, and so they became a common carrier that was quite happy with its profit margin and unwilling to take risks and invest in new ventures. Cable came in relatively unregulated and now is competing with them for phone service. Cellular and wireless services came in completely unregulated and are the new horizon for broadband to gain even more universal application. So the second thing you can do is make sure you resist temptations to move all of this into a regime where the delivery system is regarded as a common carrier along with all the federal regulation. Yes, sir. I'm Henry Weissman from Los Angeles. I'd actually like to pick, on, pick up on David's last comment. One of the proposed rules would prohibit network operators from discriminating in the terms on which they provide service to content providers. I wonder if the panel could comment on whether that's the same thing as common carriage regulation or if there's a difference. You want to be here? What's that? Uh, what's that? I'll It's a little bit different, okay, because common carriage said that you cannot unjust or unreasonably discriminate. This is a flat prohibition on discrimination. I don't know what happened to Henry. I'm trying to talk to him. There you are, okay. But there's an exception for reasonable network management. And that really is where the game is. Okay, to me, there's, there's, there are two huge, I mean, Rob raised a lot of great questions, but there's basically, to me, two battles that are, that are really going to go on as we, you know, as the FCC collects data and, and so on and so forth on this notice of proposed rulemaking. Is number one is how broad or narrow should the reasonable network management standard be? Now, the Comcast decision had a standard that was sort of like a, since Marvin created it, he's probably a better person to talk about it, it's a sort of quasi-strict scrutiny standard that said that a network provider had to show that its network management practices were a tight fit or narrowly tailored to some important interest. And in the Comcast case, the FCC said, well, you're throttling back BitTorrent, it's a high band with application, but you're throttling it back, that, that's not the only, it's the only high band with application you're throttling back, and you're throttling it back at all times of day, and not just times of day where there's congestion, so therefore, it's not narrowly tailored. Now, the FCC has already concluded that they're not crazy about that standard, and they've asked for comment on a much, much, much looser standard, in fact, so loose that we're not very happy with it. So the fight's going to be, where's the right point? The second uh, important question is going to be, should, uh, should net neutrality, non-discrimination provision, apply to wireless? And in fact, right now, it's unclear whether the four principles even apply to wireless. So that's where the other fight's going to be. Now, the FCC, I think, has wisely said, we know wireless is technologically different. We know it has different bandwidth constraints. So we, want, we think that when we you know, 
if somebody were to file a complaint against a, a, a wireless provider, will give them more rope as far as reasonable network management is concerned. And in fact, when we talk about the solution in search of a problem, most of the problems lately have been around wireless providers blocking. So Google Voice, Sling Media, Skype, those have all been blocked by AT&T. Do you want to anything more of it? Did you want to be heard? Why don't you go? 